And let's see here. So who, who do we who do we have in here? Uh, a couple people. Do we have uh, do we have farmers or people that sell to farmers or, or ranchers that type of thing? Do we know? And uh, I guess you can either type uh, your questions in the thing, or if you, if it's easier, you can um, ask, talk, what do you call it when you just talk the question? I don't know what you call that, but uh, that's yeah, fine so, too. To so since we just have a couple in today, if um, for the attendees, if you just wanna, that you should have an option at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. And so if you want to do that, I can give you the option to talk. And then that way we can just have, you know, a, an actual conversation, probably be quicker and easier than typing questions in the chat. Yeah, sometimes with a, uh, if, an, if it's a in-depth question, that's a lot easier sometimes. Um, so have either of you two been to the sales tax class? The name sort of looks familiar, not that I, I don't really remember names that much because I'm getting old and, and I forget things. But uh, if you've been to my class, then uh, you already know that I usually tell you about private letter rulings. Um, have you guys been to my class before? See, I think I have, a, is it Katie and Brent? And uh, have either of you been to my sales tax class before? If you have, you are a glutton for punishment, I'll tell you. I got, and if you've been to my live class, you know that I have a lot of bad jokes. So, um, all right, well, um, yes, so you got a hand raise. How do I do that? I got it. Oh, okay. Oh, you're doing that. Great. Thank you. Because <laughs> super. <laughs> Hi, Carl. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, uh, this is Brent, Brent Kenoki. I'm uh, hi. hi I'm, I'm a CPA in Hutchinson, Kansas. So okay, uh, I have uh, had you to our office before uh, to speak on Kansas income tax updates. And when Mindy sent the uh, invitation to the sales tax update, I thought it would be a good idea for me to attend because I get questions from both farmers and from uh, people who sell to farmers. Uh, okay. So, uh, um, looking well, uh, to what I have to say. If you have questions, make sure you ask questions. And uh, you guys have my contact information. I got it on the slide there. Uh, <laughs> and if you don't capture that, because, uh, you know, you'll have, send me a question or whatever, I can definitely get you an answer. Uh, I, I always tell every. usually I'm out giving these presentations and I always tell everybody I'm smarter when I'm in the office, but uh, because usually when I'm out, you're just relying on what's rattling around on my head. And when I'm in the office, I can research things because I can re rely on uh, really smart people that uh, write the rulings and, uh, and I have my statute books and things like that. So, um, but if you have questions, you know, you got you got my attention here. That'd be great. Um, and and Katie, do you are are you a farmer or a rancher, or do you have a business that sells to that, or you work at one, uh, work at a co-op, or anything like that? Uh, I work for a farm. You work for a farm. Okay, super. Well, um, just need to let you know whatever I tell you here is not binding. Um, and the only reason I tell you that is um, so that I can inform you of something that is binding. Um, there, I don't know if you guys had the ability, um, I don't know if I shared that with the Small Business Development Center. There's a publication, um, and it's the KS1550, and it's available on our website. And it, I'll see if I can share that with you one second here. I don't know if I can or not, but um, 
And I just want to make a, a quick note to uh, Britt and Katie. You both now have the ability to mute and unmute yourself. So um, if at any time throughout this presentation, Carl's talking about something you want to ask him about, you're welcome to just kind of chime in. I don't know how I did it yesterday, but I was able to share other things on my screen. I think I, I think I can do it. Let me do like this for a second. Oh, I know how I did it. Okay. Are you guys are you guys seeing a uh, PowerPoint presentation or are you seeing a publication that says business taxes for agricultural industry? A publication. All right, super. I've got it figured out. All right, this is the sales tax publication. It still needs updated, um, but uh, this is the KS 1550, and you can always see what that is. And I get that number from the bottom left-hand corner of the area. So if you went to the Department of Revenue uh, webpage and put in the search field KS-1550, um, it would bring up this publication. And this one is for the agricultural industry, and it goes hand in hand with the general sales tax book, which is the KS-1510. Um, and in this book, toward the back, in all, in all the books, we usually have something that we refer to um, a private letter ruling. So what that is, is basically um, if you're registered in Kansas, which means you have a sales tax number and uh, you're an actual business and um, you come across a, an, an area of the law where it's, it's gray, you don't know if it's taxable or not, well, you have the ability to write in and get a private letter ruling. And let's see here. I don't know what I did there, but I don't know how I did that, but boy, I, I do stuff that I didn't know that it even did, and okay, well, anyway, so um, right here is where you would write, um, where, where it says kdor underscore tac at ks.gov, and this would be uh, on page 18 in that book, under policy information library, and then it says written rulings. So there are things that are binding. So verbal, um, you know, conversation is not. So you call in and we tell you, we're going to give you good information, you know, to the best of our ability. Um, but a lot of times people don't realize uh, when they ask a question, we're only able to give an answer based on the information taken in. And a lot of people don't realize that the questions you're asking <clears throat> may not cover everything. So um, you don't know what you don't know sometimes. You don't know if we don't have the whole scope of everything, we can only give a limited answer based on what information we have. So that's why sometimes when people um, call in, they'll say, well, I've called in three times and I've gotten three different answers. That could be because they've called in one time and they had this much information and that seemed to be um, taxable. But then they called in and they had just a little bit more information because they talked to that first person and that first person asked a few questions from them and provided that person with more information and that person knew a little bit more on what to ask. So they call in again, but they actually call in with more information. So now the next person that receives this call and is not connected to this is now saying, well, well, this is sounding like this might be exempt. And they're like, oh, well, I'm getting two different answers. So then they call in again. 
Well, now they've gotten even more information. And so that, that's how that kind of works sometimes. So when you write in for a private letter ruling, what we're going to ask is that you write in and provide as much information as possible. Um, all the facts. So what, what the law says is you must actually be a business. So you must have a sales tax number and actually have an, it must be an actual situation. It cannot be um, hypothetical. If you send a hypothetical question, um, basically we won't answer. We'll just say, hey, uh, private letter ruling, this, it's not designed for this. It must be an actual situation. It must be factual. If there's anything um, in this is not true, that's not true, it's not binding. Um, it's based on true set of facts based on the scenario that's happening here that you're writing about. Um, you got to realize also that we are tax nerds. We are not farmers. We're not whatever it is you're doing. So a lot of times what helps is pictures, um, actual pictures. Um, and we have had people send in sketches and stuff, but I can tell you that um, an actual picture is uh, is much better. Uh, that that's telling the whole story there, and you can point out what things are and, and label it that way. Um, that that does help because we don't, you know, you can describe it, but a lot of times we can understand it more. We can tell you, okay, now we see that 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 is affixed to the real property, or no, it's not, or that I see what you're saying. That is part of that. Uh, farm equipment or, or well, that looks like it's more a part of the real property. So we can make a determination that way based on the tax laws and and that type of thing. But you would write to the uh, the email is there kdor underscore tac at ks.gov. And you just make it to the attention of, um, you make it in the subject line, you put request for private letter ruling, and then you'd make it a, attention to uh, policy and research. And then we would, uh, research this, um, see if there's any um, old private letter rulings that were similar to this and see what we've said in the past to see if we've, um, and see if th that situation was close to yours. But we don't rely on that for your situation. We also look at statutes, any regulations, any um, legal cases, appeals that may have changed situations. And then we get you an answer based on the, the uh your situation. And it's binding only to you. It's not binding to anybody else. Now, they do publish some of these in the Policy Information Library, which is available on the Department of Revenue website. Um, they do what they call a scrub on them. So for confidentiality, they scrub the name of the business and people on there. So you don't know who it is for. Um, but the, the scenarios there, the facts are there. Um, so you can look at that but you, you can't rely on it as binding to you, but it's a good set of information. And uh, to be quite honest, auditors will look at that before they go out and uh, look at it for good information. So um, it's, it, it is good information. So a lot of people don't know that that's available to them to look at. Um, now this class is for the agricultural industry. Um, yesterday we had a, a retail sales tax. Um, I'm just going to dab into the regular retail sales tax just sort of uh, just to give you just a, a, an idea what that is. Most of you, you may have had that before, but if you haven't, I'll just give you the basics on that and um, and bring it into the, as it fits into to agricultural. And um, then um, I want to uh, talk about if, if you, there's exemptions and what kind of exemptions. And then I want to, if you have a client that has a certain kind of exemption or you're dealing with a certain kind of exemption, I want to um, incorporate your questions into this as well. But um, the sales tax in Kansas, um, been around a while, been around uh, since 1937, um, is based on the state sales tax rate. Um, now it, it's uh, both the um, state and local sales tax rate. Um, Local rates include special jurisdictions. So right now, the highest combined rate of sales tax is a special jurisdiction in Ottawa, Kansas. It's 11.6%. And that's a hotel. It's a Holiday Inn Express. And so it's in an isolated jurisdiction. So it could be, it could be just that hotel, which it is. 
And um, everywhere else around, there's not that rate, just that location. So that uh, community improvement district, basically that extra sales tax goes to that location for developing that. Um, they're all over the state. They're, they've been very popular. Now, cities are the ones that do that. Uh, the state doesn't do that. Um, same way with the transportation development district, but the, the community improvement districts are the popular ones. Um, before, uh, that was, that's was that been around since April of last year. Before um, the Ottawa site, um, we had a tie for the highest, which was Junction City, Leavenworth, Coffeeville, and Chanute. And there were uh, Goody's Plaza, which is a, a, a small little, I guess you'd call it like a strip mall, maybe. I don't know how you describe it. There's a Walmart right next to it that's not part of that. They have a lower sales tax rate. And then there's Goody's Plaza that is just this set of like, I don't know, five different stores, like a strip mall, um, right off of I-70 um, going west, um, right there off in Junction City. And it's 11.5. It's been the highest for the longest time, and it's not the highest anymore. Uh, then Leavenworth has a couple uh, community improvement districts. Basically, that is uh, a hotel, and Coffeeville's a hotel. And then uh, Chanute has a Love's Travel Plaza. So uh, anyway, so you've you probably have, have seen these in area. I know Hutchinson has them. Uh, they're all over the state. Topeka has them. Every, Wichita has them. Pittsburgh has them. Liberal has them everywhere. So just that isolated area. Um, as a uh, business, you're required to collect this combined rate of sales tax. As a consumer, you're required to pay the combined rate of sales tax. As a business, you now you send it all to the Department of Revenue and we distribute it to the um, different jurisdictions. So our sales tax return has the ability to uh, report the different jurisdictions. Uh, some states do not. Some states require that uh, each jurisdiction, you have to file their individual sales tax return. So you'd have a sales tax return for the state, a sales tax return for the county, a sales tax return for the city, and then possibly a sales tax return for a special jurisdiction. And luckily we're not that way, but there are a few states that do that. Luckily we don't. Um, now sales tax is uh, in statute 793603, that's the imposition of it. Um, there is a 793601 that says retail sales tax, that's just about all it says, but uh, 793603 is the imposition of it. This is what is taxable. Starts out in layman's terms, it talks about for the privilege of doing, you know, retail sales. So basically for the privilege of uh, selling in Kansas, tangible personal property and enumerated services. Enumerated means services that are listed in our statute. You must register, collect, and remit our sales tax. So what this means, the default in Kansas, it taxable. Taxability is the default. Exemption is the exception. So how you keep your records is you show that you have collected sales tax or paid sales tax, depending on how it works there, or you have something to show, a good reason why you did not. So if an auditor, heaven forbid you're audited, an auditor comes out, they're already with the mindset that everything's taxable. The burden of proof that something is not taxable is on you. And in fact, uh, in our regulations and statutes, it says that several places that burden of proof, something's not taxable, is on you, the vendor. So when you're selling, and this is true even with farmers. So burden of proof that they purchased something not taxable is on them. So now tangible personal property in our statute, there's a section there for definitions that they use words in there um, that could be defined in uh, the real world in other situations differently. So they define them in definitions, 793602. And one of those is tangible personal property. Well, that's what they start out with in the statute. They 
sales tax on tangible personal property. So they define it as a tangible personal property means the personal property that can be weighed, measured, felt, or touched, and then uh, in any other manner perceptible to the senses. So basically, if you can feel it, touch it, see it, taste it, if it's a physical item, that's tangible personal property, and it's taxable when you sell it. Well, that's a pretty broad paintbrush. That covers a lot of things. That's why they did that. Now, if you sell a physical item, in Kansas, you need to collect sales tax. In Kansas, the whole idea is to have the final consumer, the end user, pay sales tax. Okay, that kind of makes sense. So they'd like sales tax paid one time by the final consumer, the end user. If the end user, your customer, takes delivery of this tangible personal property outside of the state of Kansas, you won't collect Kansas sales tax simply because Kansas sales tax uh, are only good in Kansas. We can't enforce our laws in any other state except Kansas, and no other state can enforce their laws in our state. So if it goes outside of the state, if your customer takes delivery of it outside of the state of Kansas, you need to have something in your records to show why you did not collect tax. Well, I didn't collect tax because they took delivery of it in Oklahoma or in Colorado or Minnesota or wherever. So you keep a shipping document, something like that. So heaven forbid you're audited, you got this. The, the auditor can look at that and say, okay, no problem. You made an auditor's job much easier. They didn't have to research it and they didn't have to tell you, I need you to get me something, you know. So do you need to collect that other state's tax? Well, if it's taxable there, you possibly do. Uh, since 2018, boy, I don't know if that just did that on its own. Since 2018, um, sales tax, um, basically, you don't have to have a, before 2018, you had to have a physical presence in a state. Um, they call it a nexus. So that is defined as a um, sufficient or significant presence in a state. Uh, enough presence where that state can require you to collect sales tax on your sales within that state. So typically we used to call that, um, we did, well, the, the law did uh, based on a, a Quill versus state of North Dakota Supreme Court case. Uh, basically, if you owned or rent real estate in that state, that's a, a physical presence. And so you'd, if you sold in that state, you'd be required to collect their tax. If you had um, representation uh, b on behalf of your business, you were uh, had sales reps, um, they were furthering your business in that state. That's considered a nexus. You'd be required, when you sell into that state, you would be required to collect that state's sales tax. And then if you uh, delivered the items that you sell with your own vehicles, your own company vehicles or your own personal vehicles, that is a nexus. Now, if you're using a third-party carrier, you know, you, United States Post Office, uh, UPS, that's not a nexus. That's a third party. But if you're using your own vehicles, that would be a nexus. So that had been since 1992 or four, something like that. And then in 2018, the Supreme Court, uh, there was a Supreme Court case, Wayfair versus the state of uh, South Dakota. Um, and South Dakota had a law that they, they called um, sales into their state with, with no physical presence uh, when it met their threshold, a, an economic nexus. Basically, if you sold $100,000 within a calendar year or 200 times, and what they said was whether you sold 200 times, whether that was a taxable sale or not. So that's interesting as well. Um, that they considered that an economic nexus. And so from that point forward, you would be required to collect their sales tax. Well, this was a Supreme Court case. Um, so it was Wayfair and um, Overstock was part of that. I think Etsy and a couple other. Um, and uh, South Dakota won. And uh, so they had that, what they call that de minimis amount, that minimum threshold, which uh, was that 100,200 times. Um, so what the Supreme Court said was, yes, they could have that. And they called it a safe harbor for small businesses, that, that minimum amount. 
meaning, um, you know, the, as, so long as their sales were no, didn't ever reach that hundred thousand or that two hundred times, that small business would would never be required to collect their sales tax so long as they didn't meet the other uh, defined uh, nexus requirements. So they um, they 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 passed that uh, that mustered with the Supreme Court and that became the law of the land. Um, and so other states followed suit and they, they, uh, most of them have that hundred thousand dollar minimum threshold. Some have, I think a couple have 300,000, one has like 500,000. Um, three states don't have any legislation on it right now. That'd be Florida, Missouri, and of course, Kansas. Uh, we don't have a, th a minimum threshold. Uh, so anybody selling into our state from outside of the state, they need to collect our sales tax. Um, now with that said, we've had, uh, the Department of Revenue has had uh, recommendations to have that $100,000 de minimis amount, um, but it's been tied to other legislation um, and bills that had other legislation and wasn't really um, uh, voted down because of the, the de minimis amount, it was because of other legislation that this that the, was in that bill. So, um, so when you hear about that, that that's why. Um, I'm sure if they, if they actually had a separate individual bill for that, it probably would have passed a long time ago. Um, now that that minimum amount, they can't, they said it can't be retroactive. They can't. So I, I if I hit a hundred thousand dollars, they can't go back and make me collect sales tax. It's only from that point forward. So just let you know. Um, and it resets every year because it's calendar, so calendar year. So, and that's not cumulative. All these states know every state has their own. So it's not. So it's a hundred thousand here. It's a hundred thousand there. It's a hundred thousand there. So, uh, just letting you know that that exists out there. A lot of people didn't know that that exists. Um, so just FYI. So if you sell outside of the state of Kansas, you may have to collect another state's sales tax if you meet their threshold, or minimum amount amount, but you won't be collecting Kansas sales tax if your customer takes delivery of it. Now, services. I hear a lot of people say, well, if it's a service, it's not taxable. Well, I already told you that in our law, it says enumerated services are taxable. And what that means is if it's written in our law as taxable, that's a taxable service. And so what I want you to notice is when they use the, uh, the definition of tangible personal property, they used a large paintbrush that covers a lot of things. They sort of did the same thing with services. They said, if you repair, service, alter, or maintain tangible personal property, that is a taxable service. So that covers a lot of things. So uh, auto repair, um, clothing alterations, computer repair, you do anything that repairs, service, or alters a physical item, that is a taxable service. So you could start in your mind thinking of things. So um, you, you name it. Uh, in, in fact, one of the things that is interesting is like uh, dog grooming. Uh, animals are considered to be tangible personal property. So if you're cutting their hair, you're altering or maintaining tangible personal property. Therefore, it's taxable. Now, you and I go get a haircut. That's not taxable. Uh, simply because they're altering or maintaining a human being. And well, we're not tangible personal property. That's why haircuts are not taxable, at least not yet. Um, and uh, like massages are not taxable or uh, things like that, uh, chiropractic, back, whatever. Uh, then there's admissions to places providing amusement, entertainment, recreation. I, they, they put that under services. That's taxable. Now, where does that come in? Well, there's agribusinesses that, especially this time of year where they've had, uh, you know, like uh, mazes and, and haunted houses. Now, this year, they probably haven't had a lot of that, but uh, in the past, they have. And then in, they've expanded that for Christmas time and different things, but they've um, had admissions. Well, if it's amusement, entertainment, or recreation, admissions to that is taxable. Um, so just letting you know that that's why that would be taxable. Because a lot of people say, well, that's just a service, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is, but it's a taxable service. <clears throat> now, there are things that they don't consider taxable, and that would be things like um, 
accounting services, uh, consulting, consulting is not taxable. Um, attorneys, of course, attorneys would be in there. Um, engineering, uh, cleaning, but there's exceptions. So you have the rule of law and then you'll have the exception to the law and exceptions to the exception. So rule of law cleaning is not taxable. However, in the law, they have listed the washing and waxing of automobiles as taxable and laundry services are taxable. Then the exception to that is coin operated laundry machines is not taxable. So there's the exception then the exception to the exception. So, and then warranties um, are taxable. And just like you sold a physical item. So if you sell a warranty, you have to collect tax on it, like an extended warranty. Um, now, if that's if the item you're purchasing is exempt, then it's exempt. If the item is taxable, then it's taxable. So that's how that works. It's part of um, gross receipts. Uh, and how that would work also is if I bought something and it broke down, and so I bring it to the vendor and they cover it and they just give me a new one, well, that's not a taxable event. No money changed hands, um, at least on customer to, to vendor portion. But a lot of the warranties have a copay. So if there was a, if there's a copay, any portion that will come out of the customer's pocket, it's going to be considered that portion has not had sales tax collected on it. So they'll have to collect sales tax on any portion coming out of their pocket. Any portion that the vendor covers, then, then it's going to be considered since they paid sales tax when the warranty was sold, that any portion the warranty covers is, is not taxable because it's already been paid when they purchased the warranty. So that's how that works. That's why with like a, a car warranty, that you, you buy an extended warranty. If you take it in and you have to pay the $100 copay, uh, they're going to collect sales tax on that $100. But the rest of it, you know, you don't have to pay anything else. So there'd be no sales tax on any of that. Um, the tax base, which means out of everything I sell my customer, what portion do I collect sales tax on? pretty much everything if it's taxable. So what that means is uh, the gross amount on the invoice is what we call it here. Basically in statute, that's what they call it. And that's defined as the selling price. The selling price is defined as any consideration. And uh, that would be any shipping, handling, delivery, any service fee, any fee basically at all, um, any consideration. So that's why shipping and handling delivery that becomes part of the item you sold. So if I sell if I sell something and have it delivered to Hutchinson and I charge my customer shipping, I'm gonna to have to collect sales tax on everything, including the shipping. And again, if it's a non-taxable item, then even though I'm charging them shipping, there'll be no tax on any of it because it's non-taxable, it's just gross receipts. But if it's a taxable item, then I will collect sales tax on the gross receipts the selling price. So any service, any fee at all. So uh, right now there's uh, COVID-19 fees I've seen. Uh, made me smile on a Monday fee, I don't know. There's parking lot fees, believe it or not. Uh, parking fees, uh, like if you go to an airport, yeah, that's taxable if they're, so um, if they're, well, parking's not taxable actually, but if it was um, an extra fee, they charge for something. Um, Rebates and coupons, just to let you know, um, if a, a manufacturer uh, reimburses the amount of a coupon, that amount is taxable, meaning that amount, that, um, that, that retailer, that vendor will need to collect sales tax at the starting price and then apply the coupon. So if I bought a nice big farm tractor and uh, they have a coupon or a rebate for this uh, for this tractor from, I don't know, John Deere or something. And John Deere is going to send this amount of this coupon or rebate <clears throat> to the, the vendor. Well, the vendor is still going to have to collect sales tax on the, the, the whole amount. You know, I'm there. So if I got a thousand dollar rebate, so they'll, you know, they'll still have to collect sales tax on the, if it's a $10,000 tractor, they'll sell, collect sales tax on $10,000 and then apply the $1,000 rebate. So how or coupon or whatever it is. <clears throat> because 
John Deere is sending them the amount of that coupon or rebate. So they're getting reimbursed for it. So what I'm saying is, is the selling price, well, they're still getting the $10,000, just a thousand of it's coming just a little bit later from John Deere. Just because it didn't all come from the customer doesn't mean they don't have to collect sales tax on it. They have to collect sales tax on the selling price. That's what we're saying. Now, if it was their own, if it was just the store creating their own coupon, they're just reducing the price of what they sell it for then. Nobody's reimbursing them for that. Well, then they would just collect sales tax on the final cost. So let's just say it's some store and they just create their own. Nobody's reimbursing them and they create a thousand dollar discount. Well, then they would just collect sales tax. If it's a $10,000 and it's a thousand dollar discount type thing, they would collect sales tax on the 9,000. That's how that would work. The law says that there's two ways that you need to uh, invoice the customer and show sales tax. One is you itemize and show the sales tax. We're all used to seeing that, that's customary. And that's like the top version there. <clears throat> um, the other is all applicable sales tax included, put that language on all your invoices and not show any sales tax. And I actually put the statute on there. A lot of people didn't believe me that that was written in statute and that that language is actually from statute. So it's in statute 793648. So I put it on there. Um, and it mentions that um, you put that on there. And it also mentions that if you do not show sales tax and do not have language, it's going to be presumed that no sales tax was collected. And basically what they're saying is, whether you collected tax or not, if you don't have any language on there and you're not showing any sales tax, we're gonna presume you didn't collect it and we'll apply sales tax. And if it's late, there'll be late penalty and it could accrue interest. So nothing but bad things happen. So you either do the top method, show it and collect it, or you do the bottom method and just back it out and report it on your sales tax return. <clears throat> now the bottom method we recommend in a lot of situations because a lot of people um, don't understand sales tax law. And so if you can just tell them, well, this is what I put on all of my invoices, it just makes it easier. What they don't see doesn't hurt them is what I'm saying. Um, and farmers might be in that category um, because if they short pay you, let me ask you this, if they short pay you, do you still owe Department of Revenue the sales tax? Yeah, you do. In fact, if it's admissible in court that, well, I, can't pay you sales tax because they didn't pay me sales tax, no one would ever pay sales tax. So even if they don't pay you sales tax, you still owe the sales tax. So if you can put this on there, then at least they won't be able to short pay you. <clears throat> also, they wouldn't be able to see your markup and things like that. <clears throat> now we understand that doesn't necessarily work in every situation. If that's the case, then you use the top method because it, it's, it may protect you, but it's no good if you're not able to work. So what rate of tax does a business collect or as a customer do we pay? Kansas is destination sourcing. What that means is that combined state and local sales tax rate you, you collect the combined rate of tax that's in effect where the end user takes delivery. So if, if they pick it up here and pay for it here, be the rate right here. But if uh, they pay for it in Topeka, but they have me deliver it in Bird City, I got to collect the Bird City rate, that combined rate. So just FYI, there's almost a thousand rates in Kansas. So you have to look these rates up. So it's where they take delivery. So a lot of people don't realize that. They think, well, it's my business. No, if they pick it up at your business, it's there, but it's where they take delivery. So how you find that is the best way is to go to the Department of Revenue website. What I'm doing is I, I shrunk down the website to, to show you that there's a bottom section. You go to the tax rate locator. Our law, the reason I show you this is because our law says if you've used our um, locator our website to um, get your sales tax rate and you have done your due diligence if we were to give you a wrong rate 
you're protected by law because you've used this. Um, so this is why I'm showing you this. Now, you, what that your due diligence would mean is you're putting in a complete address as much as possible. So you will you will want to put it, um, calculate by address and not the zip code plus four. The zip code plus four is just going to be a, a small address. You don't want that. Also, it would not be able to pinpoint. So you'll put it by address and you'll want to get that plus four if you can. And how you'd get that is with the United States Post Office. So you'd go to their lookup they have the lookup for the zip code. So if you go to the United States Post Office and go there, they're able to give you the last four of whatever address you have. So you, you don't have to have the zip code, just the address portion. So right there it gives you the 9,500 for the address there. And that's actually, I believe, the uh, yeah, that's that highest rate there, 11.6%. But it gives you the last four. And every time you look up on that website, it gives you a request number, which is like a uh, – confirmation number and you'd want to capture that number either write it down or print the page or something like that and so if um, for some reason we gave you an incorrect rate you have that and it protects you that's your get out of jail free card so to speak now with that said not every location has a plus four so i learned that from the post office they've they um, inform me of that so if it doesn't have it it doesn't have it you're okay don't don't worry about it um, also, this portion is part of the locator as well. If you're using software to, in your sales to find your uh, sales tax rate, you can have it link up here. You'd have to call our electronic services to do that. So it would go here and capture that request number as well so that you still have that, um, that protection per statute that, and get that request number. So you can still use that and link it here. So a lot of people don't realize that. Okay, so exemptions. I gave you the basics on sales tax. So exemptions. Well, yeah, there's a lot of exemptions, but what we're talking about today is uh, agricultural. Um, a lot of farmers, uh, ranchers, that type of thing. Um, that that's what we're talking about today. So, um, Carl, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, based on destination, so. Um, a business sits right on the state line. Their office is in Kansas. Um, so customer walks in to the office, says that they want a hundred bags of feed. The customer pays for it there in the office, drives across the state line, 50 yards down the, uh, through the parking lot, picks it up in Nebraska. Should they be collecting Kansas sales tax? The, is the business located both in Kansas and Nebraska? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it is. <clears throat> well, if, if they're picking it up in Nebraska, that'd be the Nebraska rate. I mean, that's outside of Kansas. Good. So that, was my, that was my advice a few days ago, but wanted to run it past you. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's outside of our jurisdiction. Okay. Now – that's that's a tough one sometimes for the system to to catch that so that's you'd have to uh sometimes have to to show that um but yeah that technically cor correct would be they took delivery of it in nebraska so makes me wonder does that business file a nebraska sales tax return as well as a kansas return because they actually do have a nexus in kansas yeah, I'm, Nebraska. Sure they, I'm sure they collect the Nebraska um, tax on that. Yeah, so that's 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 a challenge. Two sets of laws, which are different. So especially for agriculture. So yeah, but yeah, you were right then, because uh, we are destination. So agribusiness. This this is interesting. It's defined. Um, we define it as a Kansas tax, uh, farming or ranching as any activity which is ordinary and necessary for growing or raising of agricultural products. The operation of a feedlot or farm or ranch work for hire. Therefore, those engaged in the production of agricultural commodities for resale may claim 
an agricultural exemption. And if you notice, I tried to emphasize the word for resale. You'll see why. So I tr um, this is from our agricultural book. We have listed, you know, a few things here, like farmers. A lot of people don't realize that, like, um, bees and apiary product products is farming um, for resale. Um, I don't think there's a lot of maple syrup production in Kansas, but that is Christmas tree farmers. They even enumerate that one. <clears throat> um, grains, fruits. Um, of course, we all know like uh, corn, wheat, milo, that type of thing, sunflower. Um, feedlots, plant. So uh, that uh, there's a lot. Of, I've, I've seen a few sod farms and things like that. Um, and then aquaculture, there's been a few of those. They added those quite a few years ago. And uh, then livestock, and they enumerate those with uh, industry numbers. Uh, so cattle, cattle is probably one of the largest cattle. Um, hog, uh, goats is another one that's been um, had quite a few of. Uh, dairy's pretty big, um, and then uh, poultry. So mostly chicken, but there turkey as well. Um, there's also other poultry. Um, rabbit, uh, you know, I don't see a lot of that, but there are there are some. Um, I don't know. A lot of people, I guess, I guess in Germany, rabbits are a very popular meat, um, and uh, I've had it. It's good. So I don't know if a lot of people just. The thought of eating rabbit isn't good to them. Um, goat, though, is very popular. A goat and sheep. So just FYI. Now, farming or ranching does not include the growing or raising of agricultural products for personal use. That's a big one. If you noticed, it's just a little bit different color. There. That's because that's one I get questions on all the time. It has to be for resale. If you're growing it for yourself, it's for this exemption. It's not. Um, it's not what it was designed for, because this is the agricultural business. If you're for personal use, that's not business. That's for your own sustenance, I guess. Um, commercial operations. Um, so processing foods. Nope, that's a, a not going to count. Dairy products. Um, <clears throat> off farm grain storage, that, that's not going to count for this exemption. Processing of lumber, so lumber yards, uh, operation of stockyards and slaughterhouses, meat markets, no. Uh, retail sales off, and, uh, off farm and ranch supplies or products, that's not traditionally a farming. Um, so you have to, you know, actually be in the Business of farming, ranching, or aquaculture. That must be your your trade, your what you're doing. Um, a common misconception is that sales tax is not due on any item or service purchased for farm or ranch use. If you sell to a farmer or rancher, you probably realize this. Um, remember, that's not how an auditor looks at things. And so th this is how a farmer might look at things. They're going to look at everything's exempt. A an auditor's looking at everything's taxable. Now, there's some exemptions. There are some exceptions. Um, but everything's taxable. You need to prove to me why you are exempt. You're not. And so farmer and ranchers, they're, they're a business. They're just a farming or ranching business. So... They're not an, there's not an automatic exemption just because they're a farming or ranching. Now, we've broken it into four categories, um, agricultural animals, farm machinery and equipment. That's usually the, the big one. That's the most uh, popular. That's the one we get a lot of um, calls on. Propane for agricultural use. Don't really get a lot of calls on that one, actually. And then soil erosion prevention. Don't get a lot of calls on that one either. So let me just, so if you have questions, just chime in. All right. 
agricultural animals. Well, we've already listed a lot of what those are. Cattle, chicken, hogs, ostrich. Ostrich and uh, emu there for a while were really popular. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen them as much anymore. Also, buffalo were pretty popular. Um, and aquatic animals, there are some fisheries. They're exempt uh, when they're used in uh, production of food for sale, uh, for human consumption. So it has to be for human consumption. Um, the production of animal dairy, poultry, aquatic animal products, fiber or fur, or the production of offspring. For, so if, if it's offspring for those, that's also part of the exemption. Um, and I list the statute there, 793606. 793606 is the exemptions to sales tax. So if you remember, 793603 was what is taxable. 793606 is what is exempt. Confusing that they do put some exemptions in the imposition and vice versa. Farm machinery and equipment. Okay. Farm machinery and equipment. Um, it's uh, equipment that, you, that, that can be purchased or leased for farming, ranching. I guess aquaculture, but usually farming or ranching. Um, the repairs and maintenance for that equipment is exempt. Purchase or lease on that equipment is exempt. And that, when we say, since it's tangible personal property, in truth, we don't make the distinction of parts and labor like for contractors because it's tangible personal property but we have to say it because a lot of people don't understand that so what we're saying is the labor is also part of that exemption so not only the part but the labor to install it is part of the exemption um now here's the criteria so the buyer must be engaged in farming and the, per the property purchased or repaired must be used, it must be used only in farming. So it's, this is what this equipment is used for. It's only used for farming. It's, and it's, this is what it's customarily used for. Um, so we have the farm machinery defined on page four in our book. You may say, <clears throat> as with many terms, the definition of farm machinery and equipment present, present in sales tax law and our common everyday use of the phrase differs. Many types of equipment are used in farming and ranching operations, but not all qualify for exemption. For the purpose of the sales tax exemption, farm machinery and equipment is defined as all machinery and equipment which is ordinarily and necessary for the growing or raising of agricultural products. So the first category of it would be implements of husbandry. So these are, um, basically vehicles that are uh, designed for off-highway use and they um, pull implements. <clears throat> so typically you're talking like tractors and uh, combines and swathers and things like that. So they also list at, uh, from implements of husbandry that, um, that uh, motor vehicles are not implements of husbandry. So that's why automobiles, even if they have a farm tag, do not qualify for farm machinery equipment, therefore are taxable. Um, even when they use them on a farm, they're def not defined as an implement of husbandry. So not farm equipment. Yeah, they might use it on a farm. So that's what a lot of people don't realize, just because it's used on the farm, and maybe that's the only thing you use it for, it's still not going to qualify because it's not uh, ordinarily used only in farming. So that that's the other thing. So if it's a, a vehicle, it's not going to be exempt from uh, sales tax as farm machinery equipment. Now, if it's like a tractor or a combine, yeah, that's an implement of husbandry. Um, that's why. So in the definitions under, uh, I guess that's 8-126 uh, for uh, motor vehicles, but it has the that de they have their definitions eight eight one twenty six and it has implements of husbandry and it mentions right there that uh, motor vehicles are not implements of hus husbandry so um, that's why cars and trucks and things like that are not exempt 
Um, <clears throat> also, you must be engaged in this. So here's the thing is a lot of people, a lot of um, dealers of, of these things that sell these things, they thought, well, I'm selling, uh, maybe I have a, a good sized tractor I'm selling to somebody. Maybe they got, you know, three, four, five acres or something, and they're buying a, a, a garden tractor or, or maybe a, just a little bit bigger tractor. <clears throat> and uh, it normally would qualify as farm machinery and equipment. Well, the tractor might. It might actually qualify. As, but does the person, is this person engaged in farming or ranching? <clears throat> well, we've had a lot of these dealers just given out, we have an exemption certificate, an ST28F, which I'll show you here in a little bit. They just give them out and have them sign it and say, hey, sign that because that's exempt. Well, that's wrong. Um, they can't do that. And if we catch them doing that, we, we go after them. Um, they have to, you know, they have their responsibility of, of vetting people, you know, and asking just enough questions. You know, are you, are you a farmer? What do you, you know? What makes what makes you exempt? Because remember, the burden of proof is on the vendor whether that exemption is valid. Once they take an exemption certificate and it's signed by that person, they're what they're saying is they are taking it in good faith, meaning be what they call it beyond the preponderance of the law, beyond any they have no knowledge of anything that would not allow this person to qualify for this exemption. Well, if the person clearly tells them, well, I got three, four acres. Well, what are you growing? Oh, I just cut grass. I just have a big yard. Well, that's not farming. It's not for hire. It's not for sale. You're not a farmer or rancher. Um, you know, the, and I, the IRS defines it as what? 66 and two thirds of your income, that type of thing. If you file a Schedule F, that, that type of thing. Now, um, <clears throat> we don't have the farm card like Oklahoma. I wish I wish we did, but we don't. You, you know, Oklahoma has all their farmers and ranchers register so that they carry their farm card. So they have, they're a card-carrying farmer, I guess. <clears throat> a lot of states do that. Um, uh, we don't. At some point, maybe we will. That'd be great. It'd be great for the vendors. Now, farmers and ranchers uh, on the exemption, you'll notice there's no place for a um, a number because they don't they sell a commodity. In a, basically, what what that means is they're selling something that's like corn or or wheat or cattle. It's going to be processed and sold resold multiple times over, so they've never needed um, a sales tax number. Or anything like that when they um, use that exemption certificate. So there's no place on there for a number on our on our ST28F, which I'll show you here in just a minute. But um, the uh, hey Carl, we do have a question. Okay. What is the farm tax exemption for num form number that we should fill out? Um, ST28-F or ST-28F. Which I'll, let me see if I got it. ST-28F, the Agricultural Exemption Certificate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so just because um, someone buys equipment and it's um, bona fide farm equipment doesn't mean they're exempt. So just an FYI. And here's the thing. If you're the seller, don't take the heat for it. Blame it on Department of Revenue. You know, it's not, not your fault. It's not our fault either. We're just, you know, um, reading the laws. And these laws were made a long time ago. So um, what's interesting is uh, the agricultural exemption in Kansas um, really hasn't been around that long. I mean, it started out only as exemption on used agricultural equipment. 
And I think that was in the 80s, so um, 70s and 80s. So it hasn't been around that long. Uh, they have, they, you know, they their thought was, well, farmers need to pay tax on that. Um, and in fact, a lot of states have done that, uh, have said that they need to. So we're one of the states that, you know, we're an ag state and uh, they have exempted quite a few things. Uh, now, we have a uh, list that's in uh, our agricultural book. I put a list, it's page five, it's about three quarters of a page. I don't know if you can see that. And I put it on uh, this slide here. And these are things we put under like usually exempt, usually taxable. Um, and this changes from time to time. Uh, so one of the things that doesn't quite meet the definition would be like a skid loader. Um, is it uh, customarily used in farming? That is changing. I guess maybe it is now. Um, I, I've always thought of that as construction equipment, but apparently uh, farmers are starting to use that uh, more than like your customary tractor, but um, that's still debatable. But typically uh, construction equipment would not be exempt as it's, you know, ordinarily used in construction. That's why like bulldozers are not exempt. Um, but if this is a good list, you know, if you're selling to just kind of, you know, copy that out of the book and post it up there and just kind of look at it. Um, you know, like one of the big ones is like fencing and fencing material. A lot of farmers think, well, how is that not exempt? That's for my cattle. Well, if it's installed into real property, it's taxable. Uh, real property is taxable for farmers. Um, there's the ag, ag exemption again. Um, so what the law says is you need to, you, just because they're a farmer and they buy something exempt. So now they're, you've determined, yep, they're a bona fide farmer. Yep, this is a piece of farm machinery and equipment. Yep, it qualifies. Now you need to get an exemption certificate. Now for farmers, they're a little different than everybody else. No one else gets this treatment. If you have an invoice that on the invoice it says, um, farm use, uh, qualified farm use, or something along that lines, you can take a signature and that would count as like the exemption certificate. We highly recommend that you also put down what, what it is they're buying. Most of the time your invoice has that. And what I mean by that is what kind of equipment it's going on. Usually that's what we're talking about. Um, and here's what I'm, here's what I'm getting at. Um, I've done a sales tech class for the uh, Tire Dealers Association of Kansas. I usually do that about every two or three years. And a lot of times they'll have farmers come in and purchase tires. They'll bring rims in and they'll say, well, this goes to my whatever piece of equipment. They don't know. They'll, they'll say, we, we have no idea. But it seems reasonable. No problem. They either have them sign this exemption certificate and then they write down. They say, well, what is that? What's it going on? And then they, I, they, they've done what I told them. I said, well, you blame it on us. And they say, well, that Department of Revenue told us to write it down. So good. Or on their invoice. And on their invoice, a lot of them have on their invoice for farm use. And then they write down, well, what is this going on? And then they write down actually the model number, the piece of equipment, that type of thing. So um, just FYI, that helps if you're ever audited. Well, yeah, that's why that that, that goes on that. Well, yeah, that, that's reasonable because that actually would fit that piece of equipment. Um, there, there are some exceptions to the law because um, I forgot what piece of equipment it was, but there was a piece of equipment that farmers purchased and the stock tires came with a, um, it was like a synthetic belt and those tires wore out a lot, very, very frequently. And they found that if they used an LT, a light truck tire, on that piece of equipment, that, that they would get a lot longer life out of that tire. It's, it saved money. So they were putting, they were going to the tire store and buying LT tires for this piece of equipment. Um, and they got, one guy got audited and the auditor said, well, that's not ordinarily used. And the appeal, we, uh, we said, well, that, that really should be exempt because it is only used on that. And sometimes um, the law has to catch up with the industry. 
And I think that was one of the cases. Um, so in that case, that actually became the standard. People would, as soon as they got them, just trade the tires out because they knew those tires weren't going to last, you know, very long. Is it where it were? Where they used it, that was usually pretty rough, and those tires just didn't last. And I don't know why the manufacturer would put that kind of tire on there, but just FYI. But what they would do is put the equipment on there, and that's what saved them, is they put the model number and all that and the size, what this was going on. Because a lot of times the farmer just brought in the wheel. Can you put that on for them? And what's interesting is sometimes they just bought the tire themselves because the farmers a lot of times have all the tire equipment themselves. So FYI. Carl, how does uh, the state of Kansas define a farmer? I mean, obviously, um, there's the uh, traditional farmer, the one that's driving the combine, harvesting the grain. But um, I come across all types. Um, say it's the landowner who doesn't necessarily do the farming but um, their tenant does that. But they need a tractor to maintain the ditches and the waterways and things like that that the, the tenant doesn't do. Would that tractor be exempt? No, that, that would be taxable. That's one that a lot of people get in trouble over because they think, well, because really they're a landlord. They're not a farmer. So that's that's a good question. They're not actually doing the farming. They're renting the land for a farmer. The guy that's actually on there doing the farming would be exempt for his tractors and stuff. Okay. But the, the guy who owns the land. The Internal Revenue Code, if they receive a crop share, uh, leans towards defining them as a farmer. So that that... I think that's the misconception. I see. Well, for sales tax, they want them to actually be engaged in doing that, um, doing raising that. Uh, that's what they're actually doing. Um, and, and I guess our interpretation of, of somebody who owns the land and leasing it to a farmer is they're more of a, a landlord. Um, and so we, yeah, we've had that a lot where they've bought like riding lawnmowers and thought, and thought, well, I'm doing ditches around the farm. Well, that's not exempt. Yeah. Uh, this and, would be uh, a little ooh, so, so or they coastal uh, uh, diggers and things like that. Say if they had the tractor just to maintain the terraces or mow the waterways inside the field. No, still not. No, okay. No, they have to be raising the crops themselves. Yeah, I like your idea of the farm card. We we need that. Yes, uh, we've. Uh, thank you. I actually came up with that idea. Um, uh, we're we're going to have a proposal whenever it's uh, prudent for us to be able to do that. There's a lot of, I guess, things on their plate right now, but. Uh, you're not, you're, everybody I've talked to that, that um, is in this industry that sells to them says that they would like to have that because it's, it's, it's so difficult. Say, I mean, I hear the same thing when they sell um, um, UTVs, you know, um, because ATVs are taxable, but UTVs, a uh, worksite utility vehicle. If it's got a, a bed on it and they're used in, using it only in farming, um, it's it's exempt. Well, how do so that's where they're saying, well, how do we know they're using it? You know, or how do we know they're a farmer? We're coming across the same issue. So at some point, you are taking it in good faith, and then it, then the onus of the law is on them. Um, but, you know, I, I know the person is going to, here's what, what happens a lot of times. The person is going to say, well, I'm just as much a farmer. I'm sure they do the work or whatever. But I, what I'm saying is in the, in the tax law, it'll be interpreted differently. And they'd probably have to appeal it in order to win that. Um, 
and if they, they sure can. Um, and I, the only reason I know this, we've had a couple of appeals just like what you talked about, doing the exact same scenario, and they lost. So unless they're driving the combine, they're not a farmer? Correct, unless they're the ones actually doing the farming, raising the crops. <clears throat> if they're leasing the land for that, yeah, they might be maintaining the, like you said, the outside perimeter and stuff like that, but that's um, that's not the, the raising of it. They're actually, that's what a landlord does. And I hate to say it that way, but that's just the easiest way to describe it. Yeah, I would say 50% of my the questions that come my way are in regards to those landowners. When they go to the dealership, the dealership points them to me and says, ask your accountant. And uh, I get the call and, you know, I have to help them you know, next time, whether they're a farmer. <laughs> next time I get the time to update the publication, I'm going to put that in here so it's a little more clear. Um, and you're, you're always welcome to uh, give my number out to them and, uh, and always blame it on me. Never It's not your fault. You're just the one delivering the news, you know. And, and truthfully, that's what I'm doing as well. But, uh, you know, nobody likes to be told that. And truthfully, I, I don't like paying tax any more than anyone else. But I, that's why I like doing this because I, then I know what the minimum legal amount is I have to pay. You know, that's, that's always what's nice. Um, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up because that is a, a, a big scenario that happens. Um, another one that happens for farmers is the uh, interstate common carrier, which is what truck drivers, you know, when they, uh, uh, someone who owns a trucking business, what that exemption is, is what they call for hauling rolling stock. Rolling stock basically is pretty much um, things for sale that rolls down the road, that type of thing. Um, a farmer tries to get that exemption when they buy like a semi because um, they could buy it without tax and buy the parts without tax. Now the labor would be taxable on that one. Um, but that's a huge exemption. Here's the thing. It must be, um, they must have a motor, uh, a motor carrier number that uh, they must have be for hire for anybody and must travel interstate more than one state. So the for hire for anybody. So just hauling your own is not going to qualify. So that's usually where they get kicked out. Well, they're hauling their own. They are, they are hauling rolling stock. They might be going interstate. But are you for hire for anybody? Where's your business card that shows you're for hire? Where do you advertise for that? You know, and that's usually where they get caught. And then, of course, they get upset because now they owe a lot of tax. And usually it's. So uh, that's, that's why I always like it. If somebody's trying to find out before they've purchased, then, well, we did this. You know, that's, that's why. Uh, propane uh, is interesting for pro. There's actually a separate exemption, uh, 36, Kansas uh, Statute 793606N. Um, propane for agricultural use. So it's exempt. Um, now, what's interesting is the propane itself is exempt. The container it comes in is not. I don't quite understand that, but that is how it works. So um, another industry has a similar issue, and that'd be the dentist industry. Their uh, nitrous oxide is exempt, but the containers it comes in is not. And it reminds me of the exact same thing that farmers have with this uh, propane. Now, if they're using propane, um, a lot of times they will um, buy, they have a big container. It's not usually like the small one for um, your gas grills, that type of thing. Um, especially like if you're doing, gra you know, grain drying, you know, that's, that's not going to be a little container. A lot of times that's going to be a, a huge tank. Um, out, it's, you know, a lot of people have the big propane tanks, so it'll be, I've seen those, um, several of them, maybe even a huge big one. So anyway, um, the, we say power tractors. There was a time when they were starting to switch some of those over to uh, propane. I don't think they're doing that quite as much anymore. 
So I don't think there's very many propane powered tractors. Um, I think when gas prices really went up, that's when they started, you know, propane was an alternative. Irrigation equipment, I could see that. Um, agriculture soil erosion. So um, if they're um, getting uh, seedlings, um, things like that for uh, agricultural land to keep it from eroding, that is exempt. That's a very specific though. So um, if they're planting around their house, that's going to be taxable when they purchase those. Um, we've had them do like along their, their roads, different things. Um, that's a good one. If, if it were me, I would write for a private letter ruling if I th questioned it at all. A private letter ruling is free, by the way. I didn't mention that. Um, and it's always a good idea if you have that, then you have that, that binding letter and you describe, here's what we're calling this soil erosion. And we'd really like your opinion on this. Here's what we're doing. And we're calling this, is this going to be soil qualified under the agricultural exemption as soil erosion? Um, cause it's very specific. Uh, farming and ranching um, does not include personal use. Well, I've already told you that. Um, dairy products. Yeah, I've already told you that. I must have that twice. Before I go on, uh, um, farming and ranching for hire. So that'd be like uh, custom combines. That'd be... Um, the fertilizing when they do the uh, crop testing, that's what I was trying to say. That's uh, for hire. So I always find that interesting that, that that's allowed, but you know, we're talking about the, uh, I guess the farmer that is renting the land from the guy is for hire, but the guy that owns the land isn't. So I, that's always kind of interesting. Um, now, if he was only renting part of the land and, but he was still, farming on another parcel of land, then he can buy stuff with, you know, under his ag exemption. So that's, that's another scenario that could happen as well. Um, Cause I've seen that happen. It's like, well, you know, auditors were looking at one scenario, but he said, well, I, I still farm over here and I use it for there as well. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, that's exempt under that. So um, you gotta sometimes get all the information. Any questions? I want to. I'm going to be moving on. Just it's still agriculture, but I'm going to be moving on um, to be talking about real property. Um, this is where a lot of farmers don't understand that general rule they're taxable on. Um, and by the way, you're always welcome to go back and ask questions on things we've covered. Um, well, here's what I'm talking about: is contractors. And the reason I do this is because this is how it's handled for sales tax purposes. We call a contractor uh, somebody who installs or applies tangible po personal property into real property. They have a different set of laws than like a retail business. A retail business, they buy what they're going to sell without tax, and then they collect tax on the final cost. Okay, that's on a taxable item, of course. A contractor, they have two parts to a contract. They have materials and they have labor. And the way Department of Revenue looks at it, if it's not the physical materials, we consider it to be the labor. Well, here's the thing. We know they're a contractor where, where it changes, when it becomes contractors, when they're working on real property. They're installing tangible personal property into real property. They're not installing it into tangible personal property. So that's where the confusion comes into like auto mechanics because they have parts and they install them into a car or a tractor, well, that's tangible personal property. That's not real property. A contractor's installing these parts or tangible personal property into real estate, which is buildings and land. And that's where the laws are different. So two parts, you have materials. And the way Department of Revenue looks at it for sales tax purposes, if it's not materials, we consider it to be labor for the sales tax portion. So, um, 
you know, physical materials, they pay tax on the materials. Um, simply because they're the last person to buy it in the format of tangible personal property. The second they install it into the real property, it is considered to be real property. It's basically turned into real property. It's no, no longer exists in the world as tangible personal property. So that means they are the end user. They were the last person to buy it in the format of tangible personal property. That's how uh, they become the end user of all materials and why they have to pay sales tax on materials. Nobody likes it. That's what happens. Now, um, labor, they pay tax, they collect tax on the labor to install that. That's a general rule. Um, if it's residential, they don't they don't have to collect sales tax on the labor. Residential, place where somebody customarily lives. Um, if it's original construction of a of a building, no sales tax on the labor. Um, here's a few things right here that we're talking about: mowing, um, backflow testing if they're testing, but excavating, no sales tax on excavating. Original construction, that's a big one. No, there's no sales tax on the labor, You're still paying tax on material, but no sales tax on the labor if it's original construction of a building or a facility. So what, building, so if they have a new building going up, well, they pay tax on the materials and no tax on the labor. Well, what's a facility? Well, a building is a place that houses people and property. And it says an enclosure, meaning that it must have walls. Um, facility, it's a mill, a plant, refinery, oil, gas, or water wells. Feedlots, and then distribution line owned by rural electric co-ops. And then uh, it's also the, the same distribution line by uh, municipalities. But the big one for farmers, of course, the, the feedlots, but wells. Wells, that's a facility. Why do I say that? Well, irrigation. If they um, are having a new irrigation system put in and they drill a well. If you're drilling a well, that's the first or initial construction of that facility. So the labor to drill the well is exempt. So a lot of people don't realize that. Um, do any of you guys have clients or deal with um, agriculture irrigation? Because that's, a, I had a whole um, bunch of people, was, I think it was 2014, I um, had to do a bunch of people um, out in, I think it was in Liberal, I had to do that class three times actually. Um, they sent me pictures and finally understood what they were asking me. Um, just real quick, I'll show you why, because, let's see if I can find it. I do get a lot of questions on irrigation. Okay. So irrigation is, um, it's the, the people that sell to it, they get a lot of questions from the people that are buying it because, um, the to to qualify for exemption, you must uh, first of all agriculture. We've already established not everything's exempt. You know, farm machinery and equipment, irrigation equipment is exempt. Okay, but you, it's not all considered irrigation equipment at an irrigation pivot type thing. So um, the well, a lot of times they're drilling a well. Well. The first time you drill a well is original construction. But we're talking about real estate, real property. Now, if you're installing or applying into real property, general rule is you pay tax on the materials, you collect tax on the labor to install it. Farmers typically have to pay tax when you're working on real property, especially if it's existing real property. So if I was an electrician and I had to go work on uh, electricity in one of their uh, barns or uh, big uh sheds that house tractors and stuff, that's taxable. They have to collect tax on that. It's a building. Um, again, if it's a new building, all the rules apply, the uh, original construction, 
no tax on the labor. As a contractor, I pay tax. What I do is I mark up my materials. And mark, if it's not materials, it's considered to be labor. It becomes part of the labor. And again, I how do I invoice? All applicable sales tax included so they don't see the markup. And that's how we do that. And that it's not fun, but that's how we do that. Okay, so irrigation, it kind of crosses over there because a well is a facility. So the drilling of the well, first of all, drilling is excavation. There's no sales tax on excavation. So if I'm drilling, there's no sales tax on that portion. Um, so irrigation equipment. If uh, I use if I use uh, all the parts above the ear on the pivot, that stuff is exempt as irrigation equipment. Here's the thing, though. The pipe in the ground, the pipe in the ground is not residential. The pipe in the ground is not a facility. Meaning the pipe in the ground is taxable. You pay tax on the pipe and you collect tax on the labor to install it. Yep. It's going for in irrigation, but it doesn't qualify as exempt because it's not a facility and not residential. So it's taxable. So that's that's the big one. Um, so um, what I did was, let me see if I can get there. This is what I was showing for the irrigation industry because they had some questions. So I was trying to show them, okay, at the pivot, what we determined was, we, we used to say, well, if it's in the ground, it's taxable. If it's above ground, it's exempt. But they had an interesting question. They said, well, that pipe, part of it's above ground, part of it's in ground. At what point does it become exempt or become taxable? Here's what we said. That first flange, F-L-A-N-G-E, uh, I guess it is, uh, the, we, uh, the, our spell check spelled it wrong in our first publication and it said flag. That's why I said that. Um, but flange. So if you see that flange where that pipe curves out and comes in and there's that flange where it, where it, it looks like it's bolting onto that straight pipe. That straight pipe is exempt. That pipe where it bolts on and then curves into the ground is taxable. From that point into the ground, we're considering that part of the pipe into the ground. So in the under the ground is taxable. Now everything on that pivot right there, that's part of the irrigation equipment that's exempt. And so I went ahead and labeled the, just to show them this is um, this is exempt, and I had to learn what this stuff was. I didn't know what it was. It's been my experience that the people installing the irrigation systems understand what's taxable and what's not taxable very well. And after they send the bill to the farmer, that's when I get the call. The farmer calls and asks, why am I paying sales tax on this farm machinery and equipment? Yeah, and they should be. If they were smart, they'd invoice. Well, not smart. If they could, they could invoice all applicable sales tax included. I. I understand they probably can't. Uh, either their system doesn't do it in, in an easy way or um, they're not able to sell unless they do it the way they're doing it. So, um, And it, by the way, if you want a copy of my PowerPoint, send me an email or something and I can send you a copy so you can have all these pictures to see that. Sometimes that helps. But... Uh, yeah, the, the farmer just needs to know. Uh, he just doesn't understand what portion is taxable. Because um, basically, he's like, far, to, to him, the whole thing is irrigation. And I understand that. That pipe, how is that pipe in the ground, underground not part of it? Well, it is. But for taxability, it's really considered taxable because it's not part, it's not, it's part of the real estate is what we're saying. So they're making the exception on that flange as, well, now we're going to consider irrigation equipment instead of real estate. So real property for farmers is taxable for sales tax purposes.
but yeah, so if you if you do deal with that, send me an email. I'll send you a copy of this power. I'll send you if you want a copy of any of my PowerPoints, just let me know. I'll send you a PDF of it so you can uh, show it to anybody. If it's typically if it's a movable thing, like movable fencing would be if they're using it for cattle and it's movable fencing, that'd be exempt. If it's uh, this chemical tank, it's not permanently affixed to the ground. Well, that's going to be exempt as well. That's part of and Actually, that's part of their um, irrigation there. They're using that uh, to add. I, I don't know if it's a fertilizer or what. Um, tried to have a this is a, a diagram we had um, that they're trying to show. We're trying to show above the above the ground is um, is exempt and below the ground is taxable. Now, what's interesting though is below the ground, one thing that is exempt is that well that or that pump that goes down. That pump goes way down, and the pump is exempt. It's considered part of that um, irrigation equipment. But the well, first time it's drilled, the labor to to drill is exempt. Uh, now, any materials, that's taxable. Where did I go? Carl, while we're on real property. Yeah. Uh, are the, so uh, our firm deals with a lot of cooperatives across the state. Um, are there any incentives or exemptions for them for uh, new structures, new grain storage? Um, well, the, um, well, if they're building a... Uh, new grain structures. I don't know if the HPIP would qualify because that HPIP, they have to qualify on the income tax side. So there's a, a requirement on a number of employees you're hiring and things like that. Um, so probably not the HPIP. Now they're, um, they do have the um, warehousing um, exemption for grain storage that they could qualify for. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that one. Um, we have a notice that is a good notice for uh, grain storage. Um, grain storage was exempt for one year, and then they said it's taxable. But then the, the, the warehousing exemption covers grain storage for um, co-ops. They do this, do this a lot. Um, and grain elevators is what I'm trying to say, grain elevators. Um, so notice is 0107 and 0108, where is it? 0108, yeah. And it talks about, there's a lot of things, the, the building itself is going to be taxable, but it would fall under original construction. So the first time it's built, the labor would be exempt, materials would be taxable. Um, but there's there a lot of things... Are there any exemptions for the materials currently? Nah, let's see. Following is a partial list of accessories that make up the green storage bin and whose sale is subject to sales tax. That would be access door, anchor bolts, concrete foundation. Following partial list of grain storage bin accessories considered to be farm production machinery equipment sale is sales tax exists. The augers. Electric control panels, fan and associated motors, humidity and temperature sensors, stirring devices, um, spreaders. Um, so nothing that really would be that I would consider real property. So um, no, no. So really, it's like a building. Typically, the contractor will have to pay tax on the materials and a lot of times collect tax on the labor. There is a project exemption certificate, but I'm not, it's not, it only, it's pretty specific. It's for agriculture, for um, poultry and egg production, cattle feedlots, hog and pig farming, sheep and goat farming, and dairy and cattle milk production. 
it's listed right in statute and it it has their NAICS code specifically. So it's only these these people and that, and it's for if they're building a building and it has to be a job fifty thousand dollars or more and they can get a project exemption certificate, which exempts materials and labor and the consumables on that job. Um, that's pretty specific. So that doesn't help somebody with a grain bin, of course, but uh, if you have you know anybody that is in one of these industries and is expanding and making and building a building it has construction on a building they could apply for one of these now if it's just a small farm i'm going to build a barn probably not so it has just these industries um, this is new probably four years ago maybe so it hasn't been around very long Um, another thing um, is compensating use tax. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that one, but um, farmers sometimes get caught where they, something that they have to pay tax on. Hand tools typically are taxable to a farmer. Welding equipment, um, air compressors, even if, it's, even if it's something they carry on the tractor, um, it's still taxable. So the equipment is the the big tractor is is exempt, but they have a hammer or a welder they carry on there. That's taxable. That's um, so if they purchase that and they didn't pay tax on it, they're they're going to owe tax on it. A lot of times that it you know an auditor will, will find something like that. Um, and if sometimes they might I don't know maybe sometimes they have purchased something they may be. Uh, depreciating on their federal income tax. And it doesn't qualify as farm machinery and equipment for our sales tax, but they're depreciating it on income tax. And so an auditor will look and say, well, we just need to see that you paid sales tax or something called compensating use tax. Well, compensating use tax is if for something that you purchased outside of the state that you haven't paid any tax on, or you haven't paid an amount equal to or greater than our combined state and local sales tax. So it's been around since 1937. So, I'm, so basically, let's say he went over to Colorado and he gave them our ag exemption and they said, okay, and he brought it back. And I don't, I don't know what it could be, but let's say it's something large enough that he's able to depreciate it on his federal return. And the auditor catches it and he said, I just need to see receipts to see that you paid sales tax. And the farmer says, well, I didn't pay sales tax because I'm a farmer. And of course, the auditor is going to, one of their jobs is to educate. He's going to educate him and say, well, you, you are a farmer, but you are not exempt for this. You're also, you're in the farming business and this is what is taxable. And since you didn't pay that, you will owe something called compensating use tax, which means it's the same rate as sales tax, dollar for dollar, um, it kicks in um, whenever you bought it. So um, it'll, you could end up with late penalties and interest, that type of thing. And he's just finding out about it. He's just learning about it. So then they'll say, well, you'll need to register and get a consumer's compensating use tax number, which it'll start with 006, have their EIN if they have one. And um, then a F dash, however many locations, so probably a dash zero one. And then I'll have to file a compensating use tax return from that point on, which is a CT10U. Um, that's a terrible way to learn that, you know, compensating use tax. Now, again, remote sellers at this point are collecting tax, but it doesn't really help if they think that you're exempt with a farm exemption certificate. It happens in reverse quite a bit. For Nebraska farmers, a lot of times they'll come over to Kansas. See, if I'm selling to a farmer, they don't have to be from Kansas. If they're a farmer and they're buying farm equipment, they qualify. As, I can have them sign our ST28F. They take it back to their state. Now they're under their laws. In our state, that's exempt. In their state, I don't know their state laws. If in their state it's taxable, they're going to 
end up needing to pay their state's compensating use tax. And a lot of times that's what happens is they get audited in their state and then they end up owing their state's compensating use tax. Um, and that ha seems to happen a lot in Nebraska because there's a few things that we exempt that they don't. I think it, I think it does that in Oklahoma as well. Um, just a few things. Um, so if you went, let's say if you went to um, Colorado and you bought something um, and you did pay tax on it. So let's say you bought a big air compressor and their tax is 7% and ours is 8 You would owe the difference of 1% consumers compensating use tax. Yep, you have to pay that. Just for your business, you'd have to report it on your CT10U. If theirs was, if it was reversed, theirs was 8 and ours was 7 you wouldn't owe any tax. You just wouldn't get a refund, so you'd keep your receipt. Sales tax is different. It's just the combined rate of tax in effect where the end user takes delivery. So when I, like I tell everybody, if I go down to Wichita and I buy a two by four at Menards there and there it's 7.5% there, I go there, pick it up, pay for it there, go back to Topeka where it's 9.15%. I don't know the difference because I picked it up down there. It's when I go outside of the state. So if I drive to Oklahoma and their rate's less than a Topeka rate, that's when I would owe the difference. So that's, I only tell that so I can show you the difference and it's because it does confuse people. Um, I, told, I already told you about the nexus. Um, I'm trying to think of some more scenarios for you guys. Carl? What? Yes. The, uh, the HPIP, I misspoke. Um, on that form, they also include the investment tax credit on qualified business facilities. Okay. Is sales tax due on a qualified business facility on the material? Is the asset again? Is the sales tax due? Well, are, should does sales that qualify for that? Uh, under the investment tax credit, if you're uh, if you install the property in a qualified business facility, um, then you're you may be eligible for an investment. Oh, I see. Credit. I see what you're but saying. Is, is sales tax exempt on. It seems to me that in the past this has come up, um, but I'm no uh, investment tax credit expert. Is there a an exemption from sales tax on property installed that qualifies for the investment tax credit? Only only their um, project exemption. So it'd be their enterprise. We we call it the enterprise zone type. Um, project exemption certificate. Um, okay. Other than that, there's not, um, unfortunately. And that is a process to get that, by the way. Um, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's much, it takes a lot longer to get that one than the typical um, project exemption certificate that like a, uh, a, a nonprofit organization who has an exempt entity certificate gets, like a city, a county, a church, that type of thing. The um, enterprise type uh, uh, exemption, you know, the whole process starts at commerce, you know, and you have to get certified, then go from there. And usually the, that's the one project exemption certificate that contra contractors are allowed to get a refund for the sales tax they paid on materials because that project's going to start long before that project exemption certificate is issued. So it's, that's the only one that allows that. Every other one, they can never backdate them. So, um, but that's the only thing I, I know of is that project exemption certificate. Um, if you send me an email, um, I know Erin Starr, she's our economist for that credit. And I'd be happy to talk with her about it and see if she knows of anything as well. I mean, that, that's her baby right there. So, Okay, appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Well, um, ask me some questions. Um, I gave you guys the basics there. A lot of times I, uh, with these classes, I have someone from a certain industry coming in and they have listed a bunch of questions beforehand. 
and so I've hit on those. I've gave you like a generalized uh, class on agriculture, but a lot of times maybe you have a specific question you've been dealing with. Um, one of the questions I get sometimes is like uh, like diesel fuel. Well, what's interesting about that is it has that uh, diesel fuel fuel has that uh, that fuel tax, but it doesn't have sales tax on it. So when you go to the pump, it doesn't have sales tax on it. Well, if you um, don't pay, you, you pay one or the other. Now, agriculture, if it qualifies for consumed in production, it can get, it's the only one that really can get both exempt and they'd have to provide the exemption certificate. And that, that's where that dyed diesel comes in because it doesn't have that tax on it. Dyed diesel is exempt and they have to provide an exemption certificate. Off highway vehicles can get dyed diesel, but they'll pay um, either sales tax or the other tax. Typically, they'll want to pay the sales tax because it's well. No, sometimes they'll want to pay the uh, uh, other tax because it's cheaper. But um, it's uh, they have to go to the Department of Revenue to do that. So they usually have to get a refund from the Department of Revenue. So no one, that's how they do that. And it's sort of a pain in the neck. So most contractors, most small contractors don't mess with it. Bigger contractors do. Um, farmers, a lot of times will buy the dyed diesel, which has the, the exemption on it. And they have to keep, they can only use it in their um, off-road, you know, like their tractors and combines and things like that. They cannot use it on anything that goes, uh, that's registered for the highway. And I didn't have a question for that, but I just thought I'd mention that. But does anybody have any questions? So I'll open it up. Because uh, I, uh, Katie, I haven't given you a chance to ask anything. So I'm sorry about that. Well, if you if you don't have questions, that's okay. Usually, uh, I forget everything when I go to a class. I had 20 questions going there, forget it, and then I remember them, you know, later. If you have questions, let me know. Um, let me get put my email and phone number up here so you have it. Send me an email um, or give me a call. Um, if you stump me, that's okay. I'll we'll get you an answer. Um, yeah. I'm never afraid to tell you I don't know, by the way, because uh, nobody knows all of it. Uh, we have to look it up. Uh, it just it just so varied. When you say sales tax, you think, oh, just sales tax. But it's so varied depending on the industry, because when you talk agriculture, OK, you have agriculture. It's completely different, though, than telecommunications, which is different than contractors, which has a little bit of that in it or software or you know so there's just these different industries that it, it applies a little differently to but if you have a question let me know i'm, I'm happy to, to look it up get you an answer uh, i do I, have I, a specific yeah, you question bet. Sure. um uh on the interstate common or common common carrier uh exempt uh, on the about page on the website is it lists uh it states common carriers engaged in interstate transportation of goods exempt from regulation such as livestock and grain mm -hmm. um, you know how does that tie into sales so if they're for hire for anybody so still has to meet the qualifications so they're interstate travel more than one state they have that motor carrier number, and they're for hire for anybody, not just hauling their own, but they're for hire. So yeah, th that's just defining what some of the rolling stock could be. People are rolling stock. Okay. So like buses and things like that. It's just rolling. I always tell everybody's rolling down the highway or rolling down the railroad tracks. But so that doesn't change the interstate common carrier exemption, even if they're carrying grain across state lines no if they're carrying grain that's just rolling stock so they still have to carry it um in more than one state but they have to 
be able to carry grain. They're for hire to carry grain for anyone, not just themselves. So that's my, I, I'm for hire. I, I advertise myself out. I carry grain. I will hire, carry your grain, your grain, your grain, that type of thing. Not, okay. I'm not just myself. I just wonder why they add that in parentheses, such as livestock and grain, if it doesn't um, mean anything. Well, just trying to describe it because we've had because people would ask us if that was rolling stock. Uh, I see. Um, and sometimes us trying to clear things up makes it more confusing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's perfectly okay. I, I, uh, I had that question posed a while back. I should mention like um, at the irrigation, if there you have uh, electricity, they can get a portion of that exempt um, as consumed in production. So they would fill out, there's an ST28B that they fill that out um, and they would send that to the uh, utility company so that they would provide that exemption to that uh, farmer uh, for that. So it could be a uh, 100% exempt. Um, if 100% of the like, probably not, if there's a light, any light is going to be taxable or anything other than providing electricity for that pump. But uh, most of the time, it'll be like, 95 percent or something but uh they would get that's a a lot of people don't know that that even exists and that could save them a lot of money same way with uh uh water used for uh, certain agriculture if they're the water they're using if the whatever i guess they're getting that up so i guess they wouldn't they don't pay a utility company for that but um if they're uh, using propane or something to run, they could the same thing consumed in production. They're probably already buying that without tax, though. So, um, but anything at like in their tractors that that that's that's where the the exemption comes in. The consumed in production for that dyed diesel that's exempt. Um, it's consumed in production, similar to manufacturing. Um, manufacturers get consumed in production. Normal businesses really don't get that. Um, but manufacturers, um, farmers get it. Restaurants get a little bit of it um, for consuming in production for making food, that type of thing. Any more questions? I know you said that uh, sellers outside of Kansas um, have uh, no threshold for registering and collecting sales tax to in-state consumers. Um, has the department taken a reasonableness uh, or, or have they enforced the zero? Um, they've enforced the zero. I mean, they've, uh, you know, they've uh, basically, the, you know, that's just how they, on our law, they just interpret it as if you're selling into our state, you're required to collect our tax. So how long before they abolish the use tax then? Well, just, you could still uh, go to another state and buy something and pay less and bring it back to our state and still have to pay ta use tax. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Um now there'll still there'll be a threshold. I, I'm I'm certain there'll be a threshold in the next couple of years. If if I, I, it may happen this next legislative session, okay. um, what's I mean, that? What's that threshold going to be? Do you have any insight? Oh, probably a hundred thousand. Okay. I mean that's what passed the mustard with the Supreme Court. And most states, if you were to look at them, um, that's what they have. Uh, it's just a few of them. You know, like I think. Texas has 300,000. I think New York has maybe 500,000. But most of them have that $100,000 threshold. A few of them have done that 200 transaction, but I think a lot of them have kind of veered away from that. Um, and I think we would too, because 
that taxable or non tax I, I wouldn't want to deal with that, you know. 200 transactions, whether it's taxable or not, I don't know. I would hate to try to keep track of that. So, I mean, if it's not taxable, why are you, If what if they have 100%, what if they have 400 sales in your state and none of it's taxable? What's the point? You know, that's, that's where I'm at. Uh, so... So I, it's a, it's a different world. I think the the world has become so connected, and, and you know, especially now with this COVID thing that's happened, I think it's become even more prevalent with that sales tax, um, and it may become even more so that uh, you know people have ordered online more than they ever have before, and so we'll see how this morphs and what it changes into things you never thought of. So. It's interesting, though, that it's almost, uh, I never thought of it this way. Someone mentioned this the other day. They said, um, if, uh, if it's $100,000 and you are an out-of-state business, and if you're a small business and you don't sell $100,000 in a year, you don't have to file a sales tax return. You don't have to collect sales tax. They said, why don't they do that for in-state businesses? And I said, I don't know. That's a good point. I guess uh, that they ought to match it up. Maybe I don't know. I I'm a mere mortal. I don't make the law. So that that would be a good idea. That'd be interesting to to see if that it would happen. But there might be some states that are doing things like that as well. Now, what's interesting is we're a little different in that we tax food. We fully tax food. A, a lot of states don't. Uh, in fact, I think we're like one of two that fully tax food. Some partially tax it, but we fully tax it. So that's different as well. So um, that makes it more challenging um, when it when you don't tax food. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I I, I do think that we will be have that uh, threshold within the next couple of years. I don't I don't see us not, but. I don't know. I've been wrong before. That's well. Um, if if you guys would like a copy of my PowerPoint, just send me an email and say you were in my uh, sales tax class today and uh, would like a copy of this. I'll send you a PDF of it. Or if you have any questions, send me a email or a phone call, and I'll be happy to help you any way I can. Uh, thank you guys for spending some time with me today, and. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate you attending this. And good luck to you. Thank you, Carl. Your, you bet. Uh, your knowledge has always been useful. Well, I, to some, I guess. Um, I, it, whenever I think I know something, then somebody asks me a question that stumps me. So, um, But those are the interesting ones, too. So. All right. Well, you guys have a great day and um, look forward to it. seeing you guys later and hopefully get to have you in class again. Thank you, Carl. Thanks. See you later.